This week on the podcast, supermarket price gouging, Labor's dud housing deal, and Fiji marches against Fukushima's nuclear waste dumping. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by Chloe DS. Welcome to the podcast. It's good to be here. And as the cost of living crisis continues to bite, if you've done a grocery shop lately, you would have noticed that the price of food seems to keep going up. Well, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, food prices have risen by about 8% this year, which is higher than the average inflation rate. This price surge, as well as the soaring cost of petrol, household bills and rent, has left millions of people struggling to get by. And a Guardian Essential poll found that 72% of respondents are buying less because of the price hikes. Meanwhile, the supermarket giants Coles and Woolworths have reported mega profits of $1.09 billion and $1.6 billion, respectively. And this continues the skyrocketing profits of the supermarket duopoly that began during the pandemic period when Woolworths reported a profit rise of 78% to $2.1 billion. And Coles and Woolies are using the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and supply chain issues as excuses to jack up their prices, uh, profiteering from the cost of living crisis. And according to research by the Australia Institute, they're actually driving up inflation even more. Yeah, it makes me so angry that people are skipping meals and going hungry while supermarket bosses are making huge profits by bumping up prices unfairly. At the same time, they are increasing surveillance of customers, installing these high-tech cameras at checkouts in a bid to counter shoplifting. But of course, people are going to shoplift if they can't afford to buy food. It really underlines the cruelty of the capitalist system. Yeah, it's uh, even more of an incentive to fight for change, which Green Left has been doing for more than 30 years. And you can help us by donating to our 2023 Fighting Fund or becoming a supporter today. And thanks to the supermarket's price gouging, becoming a supporter for the month is actually cheaper than a block of cheese. On to the news. So the housing crisis is not slowing down. And now New South Wales Labor has confirmed it's going ahead with the demolition of the Waterloo South public housing estate. As Karen Brown, who's a housing activist and a resident of the estate, said, the demolishing homes is no way to deal with the housing crisis. She said it's like trying to stop a flood with a fire hose. Labor plans to go ahead with the previous coalition government's plan to redevelop the site into mostly private housing with 30% social housing. And I want to make it clear that this is social housing, which is managed by NGOs and not public housing, which is managed by the government. Um, So a speak out was held on August 25 against the demolition, which is organised by Action for Public Housing. And speakers explained that the Chris Minns government is about to evict more than a thousand public housing residents and demolish 749 homes. You can watch Green Left's video of the speak out on our website. And you can also watch an interview I did with Kristen O'Connell, who's an activist from the Anti-Poverty Centre. We talk about the deal that Labor has dubbed the most significant housing reform in the generation and what that actually means for renters, as well as discussing the Waterloo South proposal, alternatives to demolition and ending the marketisation of housing. Um, And again, the underlying problem with all of these tweaks is that renters don't have any ability to assert our rights. And so it doesn't actually matter what regulation is in place if the onus is on tenants to hold landlords and real estate agents to account. And that's the thing that they haven't talked about at all. Yeah, definitely check out the interview for anyone who isn't aware of what the National Cabinet decided, which is the Prime Minister, State Premiers and Chief Ministers of the Territories. They have announced the creation of a uniform national standard on renters' rights, limiting rent increases to once per year and banning no-grounds evictions, as well as agreeing to pay up to $3 billion a year to states and territories if they build 1.2 million homes over five years to address housing supply. But housing experts and activists have expressed doubts the changes will have any impact on soaring rents and house prices, with many of the reforms already in place in most states. The other aspect is that pretty much all of the funding is addressing housing supply, which isn't actually the key to addressing affordability. 
there are many examples of periods where housing supply increased faster than the number of households and prices continued to go up far quicker than wages, for example. Yeah, there are far better solutions to the housing crisis than what Labor is prepared to do. And a lot of these, including investing in public housing, capping rents and raising welfare payments and heaps of other um, ideas, will be discussed at the Housing Justice Summit on Sunday, October 8th, which is being held at the Gaddy or Sydney office of the Maritime Union of Australia. It will also be available online via Zoom. And basically, uh, housing action and anti-poverty groups from across the country will be coming together to discuss the current situation and solutions to the crisis. So you can find out more in the description or on the events tab on the Greenleaf website. The recently released 2023 intergenerational report bases its climate predictions on the terrifying forecast that global warming will increase the Paris Agreement's target of 1.5 degrees. Meanwhile, Australia is allowing massive carbon pollution to continue with about 116 new coal, oil and gas projects in the pipeline. It's no wonder then that elders from around the Pacific are speaking out against Australia's bid to host the COP31 Climate Summit in 2026. Elders released a statement on August 28th that spoke of the discord between Australia's words and its actions. The IR 2023 report does not mention limiting coal or gas projects, despite acknowledging concerns about global warming. Instead, it talks them up, promoting Australia as one of the world's largest exporters of coal, gas and iron ore, with resource deposits expected to last four decades. Pacific elders pointed out that emissions from the Tamboran Fortescue Middle Arm Natural Gas Plant in Darwin, which received $1.5 billion in government subsidies in the past year, are seven times the combined annual emissions of Tuvalu, Nauru, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Vanuatu, Tonga, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, Fiji and Papua New Guinea. It is so important that Australia listens to and addresses the concerns of our Pacific neighbours who are already feeling the impacts of climate change. Yeah, we have to continue to pressure the Australian government to take action on uh, to address climate change. And one new group that's doing just that is the newly formed Pilbara Climate Network, which organised a vigil on August 23 against Woodside's plans to conduct offshore seismic blasting for its controversial Scarborough gas project at Burrup Hub in Western Australia. Traditional owners criticised Woodside's plan to fire underwater sound cannons to identify gas deposits on the ocean floor, and these sonar booms threaten marine life, including whales, and Woodside intends to fire multiple sonars every minute, every day, for 80 days. Traditional owner Raylene Cooper has launched legal action to halt the seismic blasting. She's arguing that Woodside failed to consult her as a required stakeholder, and the Environmental Defender's Office is arguing that the Federal Regulator for Offshore Exploration should not have granted approval before the consultations were undertaken. On the same day as the vigil, 100 people protested outside the Borloo or Perth headquarters of Woodside. After a month of protests, logging was halted in Newry State Forest on August 22nd. Six logging machines departed on August 25th in what Gumbangia custodian Sandy Greenwood described as a historic moment. The same day, a win at the New South Wales Land and Environment Court gave further heart to First Nations people defending their culture. New South Wales Forestry Corporation has locked up the forest since late July, with New South Wales police guarding the logging operation. Meanwhile, koala habitat was being destroyed and First Nations elders were arrested for attempting to practice ceremony on country. On August 24th, a protest was held in Gaddy calling on New South Wales labour to end logging in the Great Koala National Park. Another court win for climate activists was on August 29, when a Newcastle magistrate said that any reasonable person would agree with the goals of this action, when referring to the case of five protesters who, along with 46 others, were arrested for taking part in the Rising Tide anti-coal protest in April for blocking a coal train. Anne Hodgson, Hugh Voren, 
Richard Bolt and Kara Stewart faced court on August 29, and Bolt and Stewart received no conviction or fines, while Hodgson and Vaughan uh, were given a $440 fine each. Uh, Rising Tide activists will be back in court on September 13 as 19 of the original 51 who were arrested appeal their uh, convictions. Rising Tide are gearing up for its two-day people's blockade of the world's largest co- uh, coal port in Newcastle in November, which you can find out more about at the link in the description. The family of Dungudi Tarawal teenager George Campbell, who died in March 2018, while in the care of the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice, the DCJ, are calling for urgent changes and accountability. The family said they were disappointed, no charges were laid, and Karen Campbell said things would be different if her son had been allowed to interact with family. The National Justice Project called on DCJ to improve cultural safety and make every effort to support First Nations families and reduce the number of First Nations children in care. It's a very tragic story and strength and solidarity to the Campbell family. Um, While we're on the topic of First Nations justice, the date for the Voice to Parliament referendum has finally been announced for October 14. And Green Left has been platforming various perspectives on the voice from First Nations activists and organisations. And we're highlighting both the progressive no case um, being led by the black sovereign movement and critical yes voices. And we'll continue to do so for the next month and a half until the referendum begins. And you can find all of these articles under the Voice to Parliament tag on the Green Left website. Members of the National Tertiary Education Union at the University of Melbourne began a week of industrial action on August 28th, following a four-hour stoppage in May and a 24-hour stop work in June. The union has been seeking a fair agreement with the university for more than a year. Their demands include an above-inflation pay rise and permanent contracts for at least 80% of staff. NTEU members from a range of departments are joining the picket line as well as supporting students. Earlier in the month, NTEU members at Monash University handed out flyers on the Clayton Campus Open Day, August 6th, asking students, staff and supporters to sign an open letter calling on university to agree to a fair pay rise, secure jobs and safe workloads. A stop work rally was held at 12pm and university staff across Victoria and across the country are in similar positions as university management stall and reject important demands. NTEU members have pledged to continue campaigning for a fairer workplace. Activists and members of the Indian diaspora in Nam gathered on the steps of Victorian Parliament on August 20 for a Save Manipur protest, standing in solidarity with the indigenous Kukizo minority who are being targeted by Hindu extremist organisations in the northeastern Indian state of Manipur. They called for an end to the violence by the majority Mete and for the Australian government to speak out against violence and for reconciliation and justice for the victims to prevent future conflicts. Rebecca Luvam, a Kukiso woman, expressed helplessness and frustration with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP government's refusal to act and the statewide shutdown of internet services. Other speakers accused the BJP of participating in the violence. Militia groups in Manipur have connections to the RSS paramilitary organisation who are behind the Hindutva movement in India and of which Modi is a lifelong member. We'll be talking about Manipur in the international news section as well. And if you want to listen to an interview we did with Rebecca from the Cookie Community, you can go to the 3CR radio website at 3cr.org.au, find the Green Left radio show and check out the podcast. On August 21st, refugees who are now stranded in Papua New Guinea spoke about their horrific treatment by the Australian government, who sent hundreds of refugees to Manus Island from 2012 to to 2017. When the PNG government ruled that the detention of refugees was illegal, it closed the detention centre, but Australia refused to take responsibility for the refugees. Refugees spoke 
about the difficulty accessing healthcare, finding work, and experiencing violent crimes. Some speakers had made it to Australia and spoke about the extreme stress of living on temporary visas. The forum was organised by the Refugee Action Collective in Victoria and the Refugee Action Coalition, Sydney. And now on to some community campaigns. And in Glenroy, more than 200 people crammed into the post office on August 4, calling on Australia Post not to close it. And they also rallied outside the Australia Post headquarters on August 17. Um, Back in June, a notice was pinned to the Glenroy Post Office door, announcing that it would close on August 25. But locals told the rally that they would be badly impacted by the closure. The Glenroy Post Office is the only post office in the northern suburbs that is close to a public transport hub, and a petition to save the post office has almost 3,000 signatures. Glenroy Post Office is one of 30 that Australia Post are closing, and Australia Post has already privatised most post offices, turning them into licensed post offices. You can sign the petition at change.org. About 150 residents packed out the Lara Golf Club in Geelong on August 21st to raise concerns about a proposed new waste-to-energy incinerator. The Prospect Hill International Incinerator would be located just 350 metres away from homes, will use 2.5 megalitres of water a day with no plan to treat runoff water, and would have health and ecological impacts. What's weird is that the waste numbers don't add up. The proposal claims to process 400,000 tonnes of waste per year, generating 35 megawatts of energy. But the total waste from Western Victoria, including commercial and industrial waste, is only just over 100,000 tonnes a year. This means the facility would be running at 27% of capacity. Speakers at the resident forum included Labor and Greens MPs, Socialist Alliance Geelong councillors Sarah Hathaway, residents Dr Trevor Thornton, a lecturer in hazardous materials management at Deakin University, and Dr Peter Tate from the Australian National University an author of The Health Impacts of Waste Incineration, a Systematic Review. Residents said they drew inspiration from a successful eight-year campaign to block an incinerator in Western Sydney and said they would continue to fight. Yeah, people having a say over the place they live is very important, which is why the Demerge New South Wales Alliance, or DNA, is fighting to give residents a say over the forced amalgamations of councils across New South Wales in 2016. On August 23, DNA called on New South Wales MPs to support amendments to the Local Government Act that would legislate binding plebiscites on council de-amalgamation. The proposed changes were tabled by Dr Amanda Cohn, a Green spokesperson for local government, and representatives from community groups across the state attended the speak out at New South Wales Parliament and called on Labor to support the policy it took to the elections in March this year. It's urgent to start the process now, said DNA spokesperson Granley Ingram, so that local government elections in September 2024 can include polls for councillors for the newly de-amalgamated councils should their communities vote for de-amalgamations. A huge number of Fijians took to the streets of the Pacific Islands capital, Suva, on August 25 to protest against Japan beginning its dumping of nuclear waste from the Fukushima nuclear power station into the Pacific Ocean. The dumping will go on for at least 30 years and will likely have a huge impact on ecosystems and Pacific peoples. Elaine Chandra, who's a justice-specific CEO and climate activist, told the rally the plan was barbaric and morally questionable. She drew attention to the impact of radiation on human life, for example, causing cancer and fertility issues. General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, James Bagwan, said the march was an alarm for the ocean and for people with a close heritage and relation to it. According to Rowena Akraman, the march started at Suva's flea market and ended at Albert Park by midday. A united outcry against the dumping reverberated through the event, strengthening the shared call for ocean protection. 
An eight-member fact-finding team comprising leftists, lawyers, Dalit, and women rights activists from across India visited affected villages and relief camps across the northeastern state of Manipur from August 10th to August 14th. The visit followed the outbreak of ethnic violence between the majority Methi and minority Kukizo communities, which began in May and which has so far claimed more than 187 lives, displaced more than 60,000 people and created a humanitarian crisis. The team met with representatives from different sections of Manipuri society, including civil society organizations, prominent leaders, legal professionals, police officers and people at relief camps from both the Cookie and Medi community and released a summary of their findings on August 13th and a detailed report on August 24th. The report blames the turmoil on the double-engine BJP governments in Manipur and at the centre, referring to Modi's ruling BJP government. The report said that never before in the history of India has a government overseen such a complete dissemination of society's social fabric that has resulted in entire communities within a state being ethnically segregated into different parts of a state. It continued to say that it goes without saying that this ethnic segregation and violence that has been raging for more than three months now is the consequence of the actions of the BJP government. Finally, the report appealed to the affected communities to cease all hostilities to ensure that the displaced persons at the relief camps can receive proper aid. This will serve as an important gesture to move forward from the conflict towards any future resolution. A project by Ukraine called I Want to Live plans to start exchanging Russian prisoners of war for anti-war political prisoners jailed in Russia. Until now, the project had focused on Ukrainian prisons of war, but about 21,000 people have been reprimanded in Russia for opposing the war, and more than 2,000 of which have been locked up for publicly speaking against the invasion. Ukraine plans to exchange the prisoners with the possibility of securing political asylum in Ukraine or European Union countries. And among those to recently join the growing list of jailed dissidents is Boris Kagalitsky, a high-profile opponent of the current war who was detained on July 25 and is currently being held in a Russian pre-trial detention centre. We discussed Kagalitsky's arrest on the podcast a few weeks ago, but now a Russian folk punk group, Arkady Kotz Band, released a track on August 29 calling for Kagalitsky's freedom. Meanwhile, a Russian court has rejected an appeal to free Ukrainian human rights activist Maxim Bukkevich, who was sentenced for 13 years jail time for allegedly firing a grenade launcher into an apartment block, despite clear evidence that he was somewhere else at the time. Bukovich is well known in Ukraine for his long history of activism. He was a co-founder of No Borders, which is an NGO dedicated to assisting refugees and internally displaced people in Ukraine, and also co-founded the Zamina Human Rights Center. More than 10 million Ecuadorians took part in elections for the country's president, vice president, and 137 members of the National Assembly on August 20. With 92.92% of the votes counted, Luisa Gonzalez of the left-wing Citizens' Revolution Movement Party won the first round with 33.31% of the votes, while Daniel Noba of the right-wing National Democratic Action Alliance trailed just under 10 points behind it, securing 23.66% of the votes. They will now head to the second round. Gonzalez has promised to address poverty and inequality by increasing public spending on welfare and public infrastructure projects, while Noboa has pledged to bring in foreign investment and has spoken about anti-corruption measures. Noboa is a millionaire and son of a prominent business and former presidential candidate, Alvaro Noboa. According to political analysts, The results have put Gonzalez in a very difficult position for the runoff. Many predict that most of the candidates who did not make it past the first round may rally behind Noboa in the second round in October. And against all odds, Bernardo Arevalo de Leon will be the next president of Guatemala. Arevalo was the candidate for the centre-left Movimiento Semilla, 
and won the second round of the presidential elections on August 20, defeating the right-wing National Unity of Hope Party's Sandra Torres by a margin of 58 to 37%. For many, Arevalo's victory was a sign of hope for a country held hostage by the Pact of the Corrupt, a political, economic and religious elite that have been united by patriarchal privileges. Back down to Latin America, and many were shocked as extreme right-wing libertarian candidate Javier Millet won over 30% of the votes at Argentina's primary election on August 13th, pushing the opposition and governing coalitions to second and third place respectively. Green left's Federico Fuentes argues that Millet's success fits within the international trend of far-right victories with five key factors. The first is drastic reduction in living standards and rising inequality caused by high inflation, economic stagnation, a more precarious workforce and currency devaluation. The second factor is the collapse in support for the two establishment coalitions which have presided over the economic debacle. The third is a desire for change, which the Millet vote represents. Fourth is that he managed to strike a chord with a third of voters, even though many reject his most extreme policies. He tapped into ideas of entrepreneurship, self-empowerment, risk and freedom, particularly after the COVID-19 lockdowns. The fifth reason, Fuentes argues, is that Millet's ability to channel the sentiment of discontent was facilitated by the lack of action by trade unions and social movements who were unable to offer a vision for downtrodden workers. We will see what happens at the October 22 first round presidential elections and the second round runoffs. And you can read more about all of these stories we've talked about today as well as videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Rallies are being held all over the world on Saturday, September the 16th, marking one year since the killing of Kurdish-Iranian woman Gina Masa Amani's, Amani by Iran's morality police and the beginning of the woman life freedom movement in Iran. In Australia, rallies are being held in Adelaide at 3pm at the Hindmarsh Square, Canberra at 1.30pm at the Canberra Times Fountain, Nepal Luna Hobart at 2 p.m. at Parliament Lawns, Nam Melbourne 3 p.m. at Federation Square, Bulleroo Perth at 11 a.m. at Barracks, Barracks Square, and at Gaddy Sydney at 3 p.m. at the Archibald Fountain in Hyde Park North. Find out more at the Green Left Activist Events section at greenleft.org.au slash events. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, then Green Left would love your support. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month, it's cheaper than a cup of coffee, and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And your support is really appreciated. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. Bye.